Are you a real estate investor looking to elevate your income, freedom, and lifestyle? If so, optimize your daily performance by downloading our free guide, Raising the Bar, Five Steps to Elevate Your Habits at ElevatePod.com. In this guide, created by yours truly, you'll learn why you do what you do, how to easily institute cues in your environment to trigger desired behavior, directly applicable steps to create a fulfilling future, and much more. Get your free copy now at ElevatePod.com and kickstart your new habits today. Your future self will thank you. Welcome to Elevate the masterclass where we dissect the elements of exceptional achievement and lifestyle design with a focus on personal growth and real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Tyler Chesser. Elevate Nation, welcome back. This is Tyler Chesser. I'm so thankful to have you here and I'm blessed and grateful to be sitting with Bill Irvin today. Today, you're gonna learn about stoic philosophy and how that can transform your life, period. You're gonna learn about how ancient philosophy from 2000 years ago impacts this 700,000 year old brain that we're all dealing with that originated on the savannah in Africa that was worried about, am I going to be eaten by a lion? Am I going to be protected by the tribe? And where's my next meal coming from? It's so interesting because in the 21st century, we're sitting here listening to a podcast, but our brain is exactly the same as it was 700,000 years ago. And when it was original, you know, 7 million years ago, the reptilian part of our brain is still a part of the hardwiring today. And so the question is, how do we interact? How do we interact with that psychologically? What thinking tools can we apply to create an enjoyment of life and create a, an optimization of outcomes and also receive the gifts and challenges? Today is about application of those thought processes. You're going to learn so much today. I'm so excited about this episode. I want to encourage you to buckle up. Elevate Podcast is all about mindset, mind expansion, and personal development for high-performing real estate investors. Today's no different. I'm your host, Tyler Chesser, and I'm a professional real estate investor and high-performance coach. It is my job to decode the stories, habits, multifaceted expertise of world-class investors and other experts to help you elevate your performance and lifestyle. Today, we're focusing on lifestyle. We're going to elevate your performance and, of course, your lifestyle, and I believe um, that as we do that, you know, we make this life worth living even much more. So are you ready to take it to another level? It is time. Let's raise the bar today. I want to introduce you uh, to Bill here just in a second, but I want to invite you to pay the fee. The fee is to share this episode with a friend. All you have to do is grab the link, send it in a text message, an email, uh, post it on social media. If you've done that before in the past, thank you. We just ask that you do that one more time today um, for this episode. Uh, because I know that more people are going to receive value by your introduction. The only way that we can grow, the only way that we can continue to bring you this type of value is if we earn the value of your introductions, just like any business would. We're asking you for a referral and we can handle it and we uh, appreciate the opportunity to influence and uh, pour into someone else's cup in your network as well. So thank you for that. If it's your first time listening, welcome to Elevate. We're going to pour all the way into your cup today. And I think we're going to show up in a big way. So thank you for that. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for playing full out. Also want to invite you to give us a rating review and subscribe or follow Elevate Podcast and wherever it is that you listen or watch podcasts, because we are bringing massive value. We're not stopping anytime soon. And uh, your ratings and reviews are so important to us. And I uh, just want to thank you so much. So if you have 15 seconds, go ahead and, and give us a rating and review. With all that said, I want to introduce you to Bill Irvin. And by the way, I have a, a very long bio. I could tell you all about him uh, in his early life, his education, his academic career, his intellectual evolution. Um, but I can tell you that he looks in a philosophical manner at things that phil phil philosophers, can I say it, uh, don't normally look at. Many of his articles, for example, are in the Sorry, ethical. Can you say that again? Okay. Sorry, I could. So we have Siri, who is uh, talking to us here on the podcast today. Um, editors, please fix this. So the last thing is his, his, he is a philosophy professor who not only teaches, thinks, and writes about philosophy, but who also has adopted the philosophy for living, namely an ancient philosophy known as stoicism. So this takes him and this makes him more of an outlier in the academic community. But I think you're going to learn about today, the application aspects of stoicism. And uh, there's so much more that I could stay, say about Bill. 
Uh, but I'll invite you to gain familiarity with him in this awesome conversation. So please, without further ado, please enjoy this amazing conversation with Bill Irvine. Bill Irvine, what a pleasure, my friend. Welcome to Elevate. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. And, and thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. No, it was really fun to spend a few minutes with you before we got started, just kind of getting to know each other. And I can tell, you know, and, and by the way, I can tell the difference when when I know it may be a little bit more of a struggle in a conversation and when I think it's going to be a, a real joy. And I say that with all reverence towards you and just the way that we've been able to connect here uh, before we got started. So thank you for that. But um, Bill, you know, before we dive into this conversation, I know it's going to be extremely insightful uh, from a philosophical lens uh, in terms of a practical application of stoicism and and really uh, many uh, much of what you've dedicated your life's work to. But before we dive into that, if you were to describe yourself in the way that the people that know you best would describe you, like the people that have known you longest, the deepest, what would they say about Bill Irvine? Okay, that's a tricky question because, of course, there's the inner me, the real me, and then there's the public image I try to project. But but let me give you some kind of hybrid of those two. So first of all, if I had to give one adjective to uh, to describe me that would allow other people to unpack me, the adjective would be curious. I'm curious in at least two senses of the word in that I'm unusual, but I'm also intensely curious. So, and this has been a trait throughout my life. It's been the driving trait to uh, learn more about the world and then to share what I've discovered with the world. So a uh, second description of me would be a teacher, but that ties into the first uh, description of, of me. And for me, writing a book is, is a, a great joy because I get to explore new areas and figure out new areas. I would also describe myself, I don't know if other people would agree, as somebody who is cheerful, maybe even playful. I like to make people smile, and I love to make people laugh. And I've been told that I have an almost pathological weakness for wordplay, mm -hmm. which I'll try to keep in the background uh, here. But that would be a, a good starter description of at least who I think I am. And that's also partly the image I want to project. Yeah, it's always it's it is kind of a, a multi layered question. So I appreciate the way that you answered that in, in terms of all right, well, if we were to step out of ourselves and look at ourselves in the lens of others who may know us deeply, like what are some of those truths that we may not have on our bio or what people may not know about us on the front page of whatever sort of publication that's written about us. And I think that it's interesting. I always think it's interesting at how people do describe themselves, but I love that uh, the way that you described yourself as being intensely curious to kind of get started there. And in fact, it actually makes me reflect on a book that I read a few years back uh, called Curious uh, by Ian Leslie. I don't know if you've read that book, but no, I haven't. It actually allowed me to connect deeper to what curious actually means and how we can uh, really uh, sort of dive deeper into our own sort of baseline curiosities, which we're all born with. Like we're all, I think we're all born curious, but some of us sort of uh, shy away from that or, or maybe have been um, maybe, I don't know what the word is, but maybe we've been conditioned to not be as curious as we baseline we've grown, are. we've grown jaded. And the interesting thing is if you look at uh, a, a little kid up to uh, first grade, uh, you know, first grade, the teacher asks a question and every hand in the classroom goes yes. up because they're very curious. Uh, yeah, and, and, you know, to function as a human being at that age, you, you got to learn so much. They're like sponges and that's why they're, they're fun to be around. But by the time they're in teenagers, they're jaded, you mm -hmm. know, mostly. And then there are some who hold on to that youthful curiosity about the world. Uh, and it's both a blessing and a curse, right? It's a blessing because you're never going to run out of new things to learn about. But it's a curse because I know when I'm awake at 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yes. and my brain activates, it's sort of like, oh, here's something I need to, to find out about. And we're also living in the golden age of curiosity where we have Google Mm -hmm. Only a short few clicks away, and many of the answers we get will be utterly wrong. But uh, you can you can get uh, complex questions answered quickly, and mm -hmm. that's wonderful. 
Yeah. And the, the subtitle of that book, I'm, I may be paraphrasing here is the desire to know and why our future depends on it. And yeah. I was like, oh yeah, that's interesting. And so it's like, oh, let's dive into this rabbit hole. Let's learn more about this. Let's go use Google. Let's uh, utilize these things. But you mentioned jaded. Uh, I think that that's a, that's a key indication when I think about, okay, well, if curiosity is one of these superpowers, how can folks who are or may have been jaded by being embarrassed of answering the wrong or asking the wrong questions or made feel, you know, like they've asked a dumb question or they've asked a question that's obvious uh, and their curiosity is like, well, wait a minute, let's pump the brakes on this because we're being punished by being curious. What would you say to folks who may be feeling or have become jaded uh, rather than curious? I mean, is there a, a way to turn that around? I think one thing is, uh, you, you know, it's partly this ego issue of not wanting to seem uh, foolish. I've reached a stage, and this is partly as a result of the Stoic practice, where uh, I am perfectly content saying before a large audience when I'm supposed to be the expert on Stoicism and somebody asks a question, I'm perfectly content to say, I don't know. I don't know. And you will see in the audience, it's really interesting because some people are shocked well, why are we listening to this guy if he doesn't have the answer to every question? But then you'll see people smile because they realize, uh, you know, this is an honest person. And the key thing is he knows what he doesn't know. What do most of us do? Well, we just fill in, you know, we just make stuff up when it comes to a, a question that we don't know um, the answer to. The other thing that separates, um, you know, it ties in with the curiosity, but this sense of awe about the world around us. And one way to reactivate that is to learn more about the world ar around you. So there's a kind of a price of admission there, but once you do, uh, the world is an intensely remarkable place. Mm -hmm. um, so my wife and I have been taking lots of walks lately. And uh, you know, there are people who on their walks, you know, the dog is towing them while they read, while they're looking at their cell phone or whatever. <laughs> And we're uh, looking at the birds, trying to figure out where the birds they are, tr trying to think about uh, the, uh, uh, you know, they're migrating and they're just coming through. You know, you go through woodpecker season and then there's this whole question of, well, how many kinds of woodpeckers do we see and, and what exactly are they eating? We know they're pecking for what bugs under there, but more about it. You can activate that sense. And once you get that, what just looks like a tree comes alive and, and it's, a, uh, it's a curious uh, thing. Learn more about anything and you will be able to appreciate the thing in question to a greater degree. Uh, having in your life the presence of another human being who utters the phrase, oh, look, hmm. that's a blessing. That's a blessing because that means you have somebody who still has that sense of wonder about the world and who wants to share the world's wonders with you. But, you know, for most people, it's just a little two word phrase. Oh, look, mm. but it's uh, you can you can also treat it as one of life's little delights if you have uh, that present in your life. Yeah, it's this, it's almost this unquenchable thirst uh, that you start to gain is in terms of uh, that curiosity. It's, it's funny you mentioned birds. This morning we were talking about, uh, it's like, wow, we hear the chirps of the birds and it's like, you know, springtime is coming in. And then, of course, we've got a snowstorm uh, yes. coming behind the springtime. And I'm wondering what the birds think about the fact that, hey, we, we came back and now we've got a snowstorm. I wonder what their psychology uh, is on this. And maybe there is none, but I think it's it's kind of lends itself to this curiosity question. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you, th you think of a uh, bird making the first migration, doesn't he? He's clueless. Yeah, I just feel this urge to go north. Yeah. I don't even know what north is, but I'm going to do it. And I don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, that whole notion of we humans are wired to some extent, and then we're, we're utterly plastic with respect to uh, cultural things. We, we acquire the culture. And then we put it together with what we're wired to, to do. And then out comes um, the, the human being, the, the adult human being on the other end. You know what the fun thing about this is, is that when I feel like once you dive into this and you go down these rabbit holes and you start to learn about instincts of animals and you start to observe patterns that are similar in terms of behavior of human beings as well. And then it's like, wait a minute. This rhymes with that. That rhymes with this. And, yeah, it's a little bit different, but we can learn deep wisdom 
from diving down these rabbit holes that we may have never considered have anything to do with, hey, what we're doing as an investor or how we're leading our family or how we're behaving as a human being. Does that resonate with you? Uh, absolutely. And, you know, a key thing to realize is um, we are uh, a computer uh, with outmoded software and outmoded hardware to uh, go, go back uh, 7 million years. And, uh, and, and we, were, we, we, we weren't monkeys, we weren't even chimps, but we do have an ancestor in common. Um, so uh, go back further than that. What did we have? We had uh, the reptilian uh, brain. It's still there. It's still there. See, that's the interesting thing. It isn't sort of like we, we replaced the old components with a brand new component. You know, what we did is we simply wrapped the new component around the old component. So the reptilian brain, uh, the mammalian brain capable of emotions, which is something lizards aren't capable of. They're capable of reflexive behavior, but not emotions. And then finally wrapped around all of that is uh, the higher brain functions, the prefrontal cortex that's capable of reasoning, but it has to live literally side by side with those other brains that are perfectly functional. And, and what, that's the human predicament. That's the human predicament. And we want to say, well, you know, my prefrontal prefrontal cortex is the CEO of my brain. It calls the shots eh, some of the time, you know, because the other, the, the thing is it can't reason with the emotional uh, part of the brain or the reflexive part of the brain simply for the reason they can't reason. They're incapable of reasoning. Uh, they're utterly unreasonable. And uh, yet, you know, to enjoy the human experience to the fullest, you, you, you have to embrace them. You have to welcome uh, them in your, uh, in your life and the role they play. So I've been watching this lately that um, you'll see somebody being interviewed and then somebody asks a question that strikes close to home. And then you'll see them pause and you know exactly what's going on. And then you'll see them wipe an eye, right? And you realize, ah, what just happened? was the, the rational part of the brain was just overwhelmed by the emotional part of the brain. And what's striking to me is people who experience that respond, usually they'll look up and say, I'm sorry, right? They're apologizing for being a functional human being. And just think if we didn't have that emotional hmm. component of our brain, we couldn't love. And think about what your life would be like if you lacked the capacity uh, to love. And um, so it's all this big package and the Stoics thought, hey, we've, we understand that. They didn't know about brain structure. They didn't know about evolution, but they knew that within us, we have these deeper other forces lurking that are irrational. And that's just our, our predicament in life. So they said, we can figure out strategies, psychological strategies, not only for dealing with those deeper forces, which of course also have the power to ruin our lives. So uh, in a fit of anger, you know, uh, you, you, uh, you murder someone, oops, there goes, there goes your life. We can not only deal with those, but we can even harness them and use their energy to accomplish other goals. So a lot of times people, instead of <clears throat> reasoning about the world, rationalize about the world. What, what is rationalizing? It means that higher brain function is playing the role of lackey to the heart or the gut. It's coming up with sensible sounding reasons for doing the things they want to do, right? But gosh, you know, what a waste. What a waste. And yet, uh, if you're a balanced human being, they've all got important roles to play in your existence. And when you bring up, you know, the reptilian brain, the mammalian brain, and you think about 7 million years of uh, evolution uh, that's brought us to where we are. And then when you think about simultaneously, Stoicism, uh, talking about maybe 2000 ish years ago when that was yep. kind of introduced to the to the human uh, psyche, so to speak, uh, by folks that didn't have the insights that we have on neuroscience and so forth. It is really interesting. But then it, I think the other thing that's really interesting is that 
our brains haven't really changed at all since 2000 years ago. And, it, you know, we're, we're experiencing the same set of emotions that those individuals were, you know, when I think about Seneca or Marcus Aurelius or the, you know, folks in, in ancient Rome who really uh, brought stoicism to the forefront. I, I want to hear more about your insight in terms of the history there. But I think it's really interesting because the 21st century is so different in so many ways, but the experience, the human experience is very much the same. And so it's very applicable today. Maybe it's more applicable today now more than ever. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, so the, 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 we got our wiring. We got our wiring on the savannas of Africa. And you can pick the number 100,000, 70,000, 200,000 years ago. And it was a radically different environment. So what did you have to worry about? You had to worry about not getting eaten by a lion. You had to worry about where your next meal was. Uh, you uh, you didn't even have you didn't have written language. You had uh, probably some form of language, but it would have been primitive kind of language. Um, and we're in a radically different environment. You know, you don't have to worry about what your next meal is going to be. Most people don't most of the time. What you have to worry about is not overeating once again. <laughs> On your, at your next meal, you right. don't have to eat the whole pizza. <laughs> you, you, you know, you don't have Please to. Please remind but me that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it's that kind. And I think as, as a side research project I've got going on, where um, the internet has made everything worse. The internet has uh, aided aids in a, and abets uh, confirmation bias. Uh, the internet, uh, Google, is programmed to tell us the things we want to hear because it gets paid by how long we stay there and stay involved. So it tells us the things we want to hear. And the problem is that we become more and more confident mm -hmm. that what we believe is, uh, is correct. Um, yeah, but we haven't changed. So that's the thing. Our environment has changed dramatically. And in the last 20 years, because of the internet has, has a whole new level has been added uh, to it. Um, but we still have the same wiring from, uh, you know, 70,000 years ago. So, uh, yeah, give us another 100,000 years if humanity lasts that long. And we'll have caught up, right? We'll, 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 be, we'll be good at it. But, uh, but in the meantime, that's another element. So you can say, well, this is just an ancient philosophy. What did they know? Turns out that uh, the Stoics were the preeminent psychologists of their time. And by Stoics, I typically mean the Roman Stoics. There were Greek Stoics before them, but the Roman Stoics were the um, um, preeminent psychologists of their time. And many of the concepts they came up with were only rediscovered in the second half of the 20th century by people like Daniel Kahneman and, and Amos Tversky. Uh, who, you know, the, the whole notion of framing, okay, well, hey, the Stoics were there 2,000 years ago, and you, you've given it a nice name, and you have studied it, and you do have a, a deep understanding. And the Stoics might not have had as deep an understanding, but the beautiful thing is, they said, you know, we can use this to come up with a strategy by which people can make their daily existence not just more tolerable, but make people embrace their daily existence, embrace the life they found themselves living. And that's just genius. Yes, it is. And you think about the level of depression and so forth that we're seeing is it's almost an epidemic in itself across the world. And so the prescription here of, you know, living a life of joy, fulfillment, and also overcoming stress and challenge, which we all experience, but we all experience it in a different way, perhaps based on our perspective. And I think that, um, you know, this, this psychological strategy or strategies, set of strategies in terms of the overall philosophy is extremely powerful and something that I've you know, become somewhat privy, you know, from an, from an amateur perspective in terms of my own application. So I'm excited to dive into it with you today and thinking about a life, you know, applied in terms of adopting this philosophy in this ancient philosophy, as you mentioned, it's interesting to even call it ancient when you think of the context of 700,000 years ago on the Savannah yeah. versus 2000 years ago, when this was really uh, made popularized by the, by the Romans. But what does that look like uh, in terms of a, you know, an application of life from a high level for folks who may not be familiar with stoicism? What would you say about that, Bill? 
Okay. First thing about Stoicism is unless you've read Stoics uh, or read about them carefully, everything you know about Stoicism is wrong. I can say that with a great a deal of uh, confidence because what most people think about uh, when they think about a Stoic is somebody who's just grimly stands there and takes what life can throw at him. And the Stoics weren't that at all. So the Stoics had a reputation, strangely enough, paradoxically enough, for being cheerful individuals because their trick was they realized that they could spend their life in a state of dissatisfaction, just always dwelling on the one thing that they don't have, that if they did have, they would live happily ever after. Uh, and so you can do that, but then you find yourself on what psychologists call the hedonic treadmill, where uh, you can get the thing you always wanted and you live happily ever after. Well, you live happily for a few minutes, for a few hours, maybe for a few days. And then, ah, there's something else that if only I had it, I would live happily ever after. So you can spend uh, your life in that pursuit and it'll be a life of dissatisfaction. And the stoic insight was, uh, well, there's another way to gain a satisfaction and that is to learn how to embrace the things you already have. Cause guess what? You've already got a lot. You mm -hmm. are an incredibly lucky human being. Hey, what if I'm homeless? What if, and you can go through the list. You are still in a geographical, historical, uh, uh, terms, you are a very lucky human being. You have so many things that um, your your that people in large parts of the planet lack than your ancestors lacked. And one thing I've been thinking about lately is um, even relatively poor people own something that the richest person on the planet Earth could not have owned half a century ago. Mm -hmm. You have that. You probably keep it in your pocket. You call it your cell phone, all right? And so uh, you go around thinking, I've got this remarkable instrument that the richest man on the planet could not have acquired, and it's mine. Uh, no, you don't think about that. You think, oh man, a new a new model of, of uh, iPhone has just come out and, and, you know, it can do this little thing that my current one can't do. And also, you know, I want my friends looking up at me, you know, and so, man, I'm going to be unhappy until I can acquire that next product. So it's a, it's a recipe for a miserable existence. So stoic approach, Take a good, hard look at what you've already got and pause to realize how lucky you are to have it. So uh, in other words, we are uh, habitually, we take for granted whatever we've got. Maybe not at first, but give us a little bit of time and we'll start taking it for granted. It becomes our new launching pad for an even better uh, thing that once we get it, we'll take for granted. So uh, trick is don't take, take things for granted. And they came up with specific strategies to avoid having that happen. Yeah. And I, I want to dive into that. I want to dive into those strategies. But I think what you just laid in terms of foundation here is critical. And it, it makes me think of the quote, and, and I may butcher this, so please uh, bear with me here, Bill. Okay. But I believe it was Seneca who said, it's not the conditions of our life or our circumstances, but it's our estimation of it, which creates our outcomes or our fulfillment in our life. And again, I know that's a butchered comment, but I think the thought process is, okay, you just mentioned the iPhone example. The iPhone example is, okay, I don't have the newest one, so I feel this dissatisfaction and, you know, I lack all of these things that I would have if I had the newest iPhone. The other side of it is, if I'm a real estate investor, it's, yeah, but all of my peers uh, have built this type of portfolio and their cash flow is just unbelievable and the amount of, you know, freedom that they're experiencing is phenomenal. And by the way, they're building this tremendous net worth that I'm nowhere near, uh, versus I'm so grateful for where I'm at. You know, I can't believe, you know, the, the tools and the, you know, the strategies and the information, the network that I've tapped into based on where we are in the 21st century, all of these beautiful things. And so it's the estimation of those circumstances by starting with a sense of gratitude for that. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Um, the thing is we're wired to want to be rich and famous 
And actually, that's an overstatement because on the savannas of Africa, you couldn't be rich and famous. I mean, you ran in a crowd of, uh, uh, you know, 20, 30 people, many of whom were, were relatives. But what you could have is social status. And it was very important uh, then that you had social status because it determined whether you got to mate with anybody, and if so, who you got to mate with. It also uh, probably played a role in whether you got your next meal. And if you did, whether you got the good stuff or the whatever no one else uh, wanted. So it was, it was important to have a social status. It was also important to have possessions, uh, although back then, you would have a limited number of possessions because you had to carry what, whatever possessions you had. Um, but we're wired to want more. We're wired to want more status. We're wired to want more things. And uh, so, and it was a lifesaver back then, <laughs> but we've moved on. And now we're in an environment where, um, where you, you, you can want and there's always going to be something else to want. So uh, I know people who are, uh, who are vastly more uh, affluent than I am. And uh, the interesting thing is to realize that in many cases, they're simply playing a different game than I am. And you can think of life in terms of, of games. Uh, so what am I, what game am I playing? Well, I'm basically not so much out to impress people. There are some people I want very much to impress. Uh, if Seneca could be, um, could be brought forward in time, I would want him to say, you're doing good, kid. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Um, uh, and there are other people. So I assign people the role of mentor. Uh, and sometimes I let them know, often I don't, but I do know that these are people that uh, I can learn a lot from. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm in their presence, I, I, I simply shut my mouth and take notes because they're <laughs> going to tell me uh, important things I need to know. It's just the quickest, best way to learn new things. Um, but there are other people for whom that, that simply isn't true. I know they're playing a different game than I am. I know that for them, what's valuable simply isn't valuable for me. And you know what? If they want to work really hard and get the thing they value – more power to them. I'm not going to get in their way. Now, I, I might, if they ever asked, might sort of suggest, you know, there is a better way uh, to go. Um, so I may be losing their game, but I'm winning the own, the, the, my internal game. What is success then? For me, success is a life that is uh, relatively free of negative emotions, emotions like anger, uh, envy, uh, regret, uh, and a, a life that is rich in positive emotions. So some people think the Stoics were anti-emotion, but that simply isn't the case. They had nothing against positive emotions, like emotions, like delights. Delights are these tiny little things that can just make your day or make your hour, maybe. Uh, but, you know, I mentioned, uh, you know, we, we go on walks and, and you go up to a tree and you'll see a bug on a tree. And, uh, and if you look carefully in our thinking, it's just absolutely a, a wonderful thing to experience. Uh, but, but again, it's easy not to see it at all. So people go through lives with almost no delights. For them, what would be a delight? Ah, I know, a seat in a private jet crossing the Atlantic in comfort with all the champagne I can drink. Okay. Hey, that works for you. Guess what? Seeing an unusual bug works for me. Uh, and, uh, and, and that makes me a lucky person because it's a lot cheaper and easier to find an interesting bug than it is to rent a jet to do, to do whatever. There are also people who are rich and famous and are miserable. And I certainly I certainly don't want that. There are rich and people, people who are rich and famous who are also a contented individuals. Uh, here's, a, here's a paradox for you. Uh, it's possible to acquire interesting amounts of money without simultaneously. Uh, suppose you, you do value simple things in life. And suppose you are a productive individual you're going to be creating money and it's going to be hard for you to think of something worth spending it on. Mm -hmm. 
you're going you're gonna to end up with wealth. It's a, just a, a curious thing. And there are other people who are the opposite of that, who overspend their credit cards because what? Ah, they need to cut a certain figure in public. They need to create a certain image and they get themselves in trouble uh, trying to do that. I just refuse to play that social status game. Take me as I am. Mm. And I will do my best to do right by you. Um, but uh, am I out to impress you? Maybe, depending on what your values are. You know, if you're Seneca, yeah, I'm out to impress you. But otherwise, uh, you know, you're playing a different game. And mm -hmm. it's okay. It's okay. Because you can win your game. and I can win my game. And we're both uh, better off now behind the scenes. But buzz, buzz, my game's better than your game if what you want to have is a satisfying life. Hey guys, just a quick word from our sponsor, then we'll be right back to the show. This episode of Elevate is brought to you by CF Capital, a national real estate investment firm founded by myself and my business partner, Brian Flaherty. CF Capital's mission is to provide property investment and asset management solutions to help investors like you maximize their returns by investing in high value multifamily communities. If you are looking for risk adjusted alternative investments in quality apartment communities are seeking tax optimized cash flow with appreciation upside without all the hassles of management, you might benefit from learning more about investing alongside our team. You're invited to reach out and learn more about how you can invest with us by visiting cfcapllc.com. We're also currently offering a free ebook called The Bottom Line, 10 Ways to Increase Cash Flow in an Apartment Complex. Whether you're a new or experienced investor, we're confident you'll find massive value in this resource. So go get your free copy today at cfcapllc.com. And now, Please enjoy the rest of the show. Hey guys, my friend Damian Lupo just informed me that checkbook IRAs have been made illegal by the U.S. tax court. That means if you have a checkbook IRA, your holdings are now disqualified. That means taxes and penalties of up to 50% or more. Don't panic. Damien and the EQRP company can fix this. Lucky for you, those IRAs can be converted into EQRPs. Plus, you can do this retroactive to the last year, getting tax deductions and reducing your taxable income from last year. Want to invest your 401k or IRA in real estate, Bitcoin, gold, or even your own business? You can. Whether you're a full-time investor, retired, a dentist with dozens of employees, if you're listening, you qualify. The EQRP works and is your secret weapon. And now it's retroactive. They have your solution. By the way, if you got bad advice and use an IRA for an apartment syndication, you are sitting on a UBIT time bomb. But don't worry, there's a solution, the EQRP. The EQRP company is ready to help you get control of your money, kill UBIT, and help you pay way less taxes. Want to learn more about this strategy? Simply text the word ELEVATE to 307-213-3475 for Damien's brand new 2022 EQRP special report. Paying tax or letting Wall Street suck you dry is dumb. Your first step is freeing your retirement money by sending a text to 307-213-3475 with the word elevate. Yeah, I want to dive into that uh, in terms of really obtaining that satisfaction and living that type of satisfied life through the practice of stoicism. My first entrance to this space was reading letters from a Stoic, uh, from Seneca, who you've mentioned a few times. Additionally, reading Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. And both of these are timeless classics, really, to, you know, to help us understand how to deal with challenging circumstances, how to uh, evaluate circumstances in your life, whether they're good, bad. And, and you mentioned sort of the, the success being free of negative emotions and rich of positive emotions. When I think about reading some of the works from Marcus Aurelius in meditations, obviously an emperor dealing with war and tremendous challenge. I mean, almost the, the beginning of the end of the, you know, the collapse of the Roman empire, um, obviously a very, very difficult uh, set of circumstances and one that you would think would be filled with negative emotions. But I think the application of this philosophy allowed him to still live a life of meaning and satisfaction and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, but I'd also love to hear further how we sort of bring that forward for today's listener, so to speak, um, dealing with stress, dealing with maybe that dissatisfaction saying, look, I still want to go to the next level. I still want to bring things to the next level, but I also want to live satisfied today. So thinking about the juxtaposition of both 2000 years ago with Marcus Aurelius and the modern day sort of warrior, the high performer who's wanting to create more, who's wanting to create more options, you know, sort of in their life and their business. What does that mean to you? And what sort of strategies would you point to? 
Okay, uh, so as far as uh, the Stoics uh, themselves went, they faced a lot of challenges. Uh, see, Marcus Aurelius, yeah, had challenges, but he got to be emperor of Rome, you know, and, and, that's, right. and that's pretty good upside to that. Uh, but it was still a lot of challenges that he experienced, but then you pick other lesser uh, you know, uh, other Stoics, uh, Seneca was a uh, first century uh, AD equivalent of a billionaire. He was the leading playwright of his time. He was counselor uh, to uh, an emperor who wasn't the emperor himself, but yet was exiled and was sentenced to death by suicide. Um, uh, Epictetus uh, was a slave and yet found um, uh, and, and he had been lamed by his master, beaten so bad that he was lame, and yet found um, uh, Stoicism to be a valuable resource. Uh, Musonius Rufus, uh, who I, he's the fourth uh, Roman Stoic. Um, there were more than that, but he, he is um, one with whom I'm, I'm acquainted. And um, he uh, was exiled, one of the, the, the worst exiles possible to an island in the Aegean uh, known as Yaros, which, which I hope to visit this, this fall as a kind of a pilgrimage, a stoic pilgrimage. That's exciting. Uh, yeah, uh, that'll be neat, uh, uh, COVID willing, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, but uh, you know, people would come to visit him on this island, his, his students. He was actually the teacher of Epictetus. Students would come to visit him on this island and, and they'd get there and he would cheer them up. Right. They came to cheer him up and it would be just the opposite. And, uh, you know, and this whole notion of, of, of exile and uh, stoicism prepares you for exile. Since, so in stoicism, you're trying to enjoy your current existence while simultaneously preparing yourself for the worst. So they're, they're sort of like psychological preppers, you know, mm -hmm. we, we can look down at preppers uh, and then, and then we get something like uh the toilet paper shortage of, of 2020, <laughs> you know, and, and then, and then, wow, you know, all right, well, they got right about that. But, mm -hmm. uh, but that whole notion of what you're doing is enjoying life right now while realizing, you know, and one reason to enjoy it, one reason to really savor it is because there's a good chance that it won't last. Uh, sure. So, uh, a well, puzzle. and that's a good point though. Uh, okay. Like, time is fleeting and that's yes. one of the central thought processes is every yes. moment is fleeting. Yes. And you have X number of days left to live. I don't know the value of X, but you do have uh, X number of days. Uh, I, I just turned 70 recently. Um, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Went out to, uh, buy some spices. We were out of cloves. And so I was, you know, and cloves are kind of expensive. And I was grumbling about that and got a little one ounce container of cloves. And as I was buying it, I was thinking, hmm, at the rate at which I use cloves, this just might be a lifetime supply of cloves. <laughs> but as a stoic, you know, you're reflecting. That's one of the things you think about is that I have X days to live. Um, Memento and, mori. Yeah. And I've got to, uh, I've got to uh, do my best to fill those days with time well spent. Uh, if you're a 20 year old, you know, the days, yeah, I got it. I got a, a million of them. I, I actually, I did the math recently and it's like, I got 27,000 of them, you know, the expected lifespan. And so, you know what, if I waste one big deal, uh, whereas uh, when you get on in life, well, my wife asked me what I wanted to do on my 70, 70th birthday. And I said, oh, wake up. <laughs> right? Because <laughs> that is a good 70th birthday. Uh, and if anything else happens, hey, that's the icing on, on the cake. So that whole, that whole notion, you know, of, uh, of appreciating what you've got. And, and, and one of the things that makes you appreciate it is the realization that it could, uh, that it could go away, that it needn't have been there in the first place. But it's not in this way of, you know, worrying about that. No. Right. That, that's the difference. It's almost like and I think about this is it's on, on the other end of the spectrum. But it's like if you're getting a massage, I don't know if you've ever thought this, you're getting a massage. You're like, this is the best thing ever. This is amazing. This feels phenomenal. And man, I wonder how many minutes I have left. I bet I only have 32 minutes left and man, they're going to go by fast. And then da, 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 da. I don't know if you've ever had that thought, but that's the other side of it. It's like this good thing is not going to last. And it's almost the same thing with life, right? 
Yeah, but that can actually make the, the good thing. That can m make the good thing a more intense good thing than it otherwise would be. Uh, think about, um, think about uh, parting kisses. There's one parting kiss that you might give to your significant other as you're headed off uh, to work or whatever. Uh, I'll be home for dinner, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And think about when um, a, a parting kiss, uh, when uh, uh, your significant other is being um, wheeled into the, uh, uh, you know, uh, surgery, mm -hmm. thing, right, to have serious surgery done. Same kiss, two remarkably different uh, uh, experiences. How come? Because uh, in the, the surgery one, uh, one of the things that's in the corner of your mind is, you know, this could be, this could be it. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other one, it's just a throwaway uh, kind of thing. It's a, it's a peck because, uh, hey, I'm sure there's going to be millions more where right. this uh, came from. Now, at the same time, like you point out, you, you don't want to live in a, a life of anxiety where you're always saying, oh, death could come, death could come. Right. Because that's a recipe for miserable existence, probably deep depression and all of those, uh, all of those bad things. But, um, but to have it, it's a thought in the corner of your mind right? It's, it's there. And so when you're doing something, uh, you do it with a kind of intensity that otherwise would be missing. So it's enjoying today and prepping for the worst, right? Yes. I mean, from a, from a foundational perspective. So one strategy is thinking about memento mori. Look, you know, this is, uh, this life is, it's limited. There's a time frame here. And at some point, this will not be, you know, forever. And so appreciate the moments for what they are. What yeah. other strategies are central to this thought process? Uh, another related strategy is what the Stoics call negative visualization, <clears throat> where you take something that you have and probably take for granted and you give yourself uh, just a few seconds to think about what your life would be like if you lost that thing. And so the thing you value, there's a whole bunch of things you can pick. It might be your job, might be your partner, might be your health, might, might be your bank account. You know, you can, you can name a, a bunch of things. If you're a parent, might be your, your children. Uh, and then just give yourself a few seconds to think, okay, what would it be like if this thing or being were missing from my life because this happens, you know, but your friends, friendships end, you know? Mm -hmm. So what would that be like? And it's curious, but it has um, a psychological impact on you because the next time you encounter that thing, that friend, that person, uh, it'll be a different experience. It'll be like, oh, lucky me, that person or that thing is still part of my life. And uh, I'm absolutely blessed that that's the case. It gives an intensity. You know, most people just go through life. They, they're going through the motions. They're bored. Uh, but it puts in a kind of intensity on that. And, and your massage, same thing. You know, if, uh, if you said, oh, this is a massage that could last forever. Uh, nah, <laughs> you're going to get tired of it. But if you're thinking you know, I'm really enjoying this. So what I ought to do is stay focused while I'm doing it. I shouldn't be thinking now about what I'm going to have for dinner, because that's going to take care of itself. I should be thinking about this experience. When you're conversing with other people, uh, one interesting thing you can do is you can immerse yourself in the conversation, because a lot of what people call conversations isn't communication at all. It's one person um, waiting patiently until the other person stops talking so they can reveal to the other person what the truth of the matter really is. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but conversation can be at a much deeper level than that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's, uh, and that's wonderful. It's wonderful that it, that it can play that role, but uh, it, it, that's not default for us. It's not default that, that it plays that role. We have to kind of go into it with a frame of mind. I always like to sort of give some context in terms of how I think about things. And, you know, I think that hopefully it lends itself towards, hey, why may other people think in a certain way or my, why may this thought process uh, be helpful? But when I, I originally encountered um, stoicism personally, after kind of going through a lot of challenging things in my business that were keeping me up at night, that I was so stressed about, that I was so worried about, you know, I first 
real estate deal I ever did was like there was negative cash flow. There was problem like every problem that you can ever imagine. That's, you know, basically my mind is telling me, hey, you're going to sink and, you know, this ship is going down and you're going down with it. And when I started to learn, you know, on one side, it's like, hey, be comfortable being uncomfortable, grow through that discomfort, right? That's one side, you know, outside of stoicism thought process. Inside of stoicism, uh, Seneca, again, he says, we suffer more in our imagination than we do in reality. And so when I learned that, I'm like, well, wait a minute, what does that mean? And then I start to apply this and say, well, wait a minute, is this really bad? Is this really as bad as I'm estimating it to be? And is it just the suffering that I'm putting myself through by my own internal dialogue. You know what I mean? Yeah. At, at two in the morning, by the way, everything seems worse than it actually is. Yes. You, so you could go through it knowing, you know, when I wake up and, and have my cup of coffee, it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be this bad. A, at a certain level of stoic practice, which I, I have reached and, and gone beyond, it's a curious phenomenon because this whole notion of, um, things that make you uncomfortable, things that give you a degree of, of distress, things where there's a possibility of failure. Most people avoid those things, but at a certain level of your practice, you engage in what I've described as uh, stoic uh, training, where mm -hmm. you go out of your way to do things that are going to make you uncomfortable. You go out of your way to do things where failure is a real possibility. Now, not catastrophic failure. You know, you jump off the top of the Grand Canyon, you're not going to be a stoic for very long. <laughs> you know, Fair enough. In, in that. But, um, but, but uh, the notion of expanding your comfort zone, and, and what does that mean? That means take something that, that scares you and do it. And do it in a safe way, but do it. Uh, so in my case, I used to be hesitant to, to speak, uh, to do public speaking. And now it just is astonishing to me how I can do it with close to zero um, anxiety. How do you get there? Well, you have to earn it. How do you get there? You get there and you blow it. And then you realize, oh, I did it. I blew it. I'm still around. Yeah. I'm going to learn from that. And I'm going to go on to make bigger, better mistakes than I did before. And, and you have to go through that process uh, with practice comes both confidence and competence, the two C's. And, uh, and, and people want a shortcut. They want to pretend like they're confident, uh, but you can actually be confident. And what gives you the confidence? Well, because you know that the, the worst thing that can happen is something you can bounce back from. Uh, Stoics were, were, were big at bouncing. You know, they said, if you, here's a way never to fail in life. I'm going to give you a surefire formula never to fail in life. Don't do anything hard. Mm -hmm. And you will never fail in life. And you'll also be in most people's value system. You'll be a failure in life, but you'll never fail in life. So what's the other plan? Uh, go into life with doing challenging things. So in stoic training, we do things that are difficult simply because they're difficult. How come? because we're going to get better at doing them. And if we fail, we're going to practice failing. We're going to learn how to fail in a graceful way. And most importantly, we're going to learn how to learn from our failures and rebound from our failures. Those are two very important life skills to possess. And you almost learn in that circumstance that it's not as bad as you told yourself it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other, I feel like that's a part of the training, right? I mean, I feel like that's a centerpiece. Yeah, no, that, that is, that is the thing you, you thought and the only way you can do that, though, the only way you can convince yourself is to actually go through the process mm -hmm. and realize, oh, oh, that's not so bad. Uh, the things you imagine, your imagination is just far more potent than reality is, uh, you know, and I, I, I have at night, I routinely have the most amazing uh, crazy dreams. My, my, my dreams usually involve problem solving in some sense, but the problems are really difficult to solve because physics has stopped working. You know, it's no longer in play and people pop into and out of existence. Some people talk about uh, being able to live the life of their dreams. I would like to uh, 
I, I do not want to live the life of my dreams. I wish my <laughs> dreams were more like my daily waking uh, existence. Um, but that whole notion that you want, you have to expose yourself. And if you do so in the right frame of mind, it becomes key to personal growth. And with comfort, uh, put yourself outside your comfort zone because uh, what's going to happen is your comfort zone is going to expand. You're, you're not even going to notice things that make other people that they're just, they're just terribly upset about. Okay. Oh, it's hot in this room. If you've got an expanded comfort zone, you sort of say, hmm, maybe a bit warm. I don't know. Not really <laughs> hot. Right. And they'll, they'll obs uh, obsess over that. If you're an easy to please individual, <laughs> life is so much easier than if you're a connoisseur who has to have one particular kind of wine and it has to be chilled, you know, and it has to be decanted and it has to be in a certain glass. That, that's a recipe for a miserable existence. But if you say, hey, um, uh, it's wine, that's good. Maybe better than water, maybe not, <laughs> but you have that choice. Uh, but people, it's a curious thing about people. They think that it's a defect, a personal defect, if you're easy to please. You should be really picky. Yeah, you can do that, but that means you're going to have to work really hard to get the things that you think you absolutely need when you don't, in fact, absolutely need them. That's really helpful. Um, when you think about dealing with setbacks, dealing with stress, dealing with the daily demands, I mean, in one sense, it's, hey, step into this expanded comfort zone, realize that, you know, your estimation of the circumstance is probably, you know, to the nth degree higher than the challenge of the the actual situation actually presents. And maybe it's that 2am mind uh, telling you that all the worst things are going to happen. But what are some other practical tips that you might suggest for folks when you think about dealing with stress demands, um, you know, tips more for kind of living like that stoic? What else does that look like? Yeah. So when you go about your day, realize, I mean, here's another. So in the book of my book, The Stoic uh, Challenge, I describe uh, many of these. Uh, another thing, when you encounter a stressful situation, uh, you can do the stoic test strategy. And um, what that is, is you treat the challenge, the setback, the stressful event, you frame it, you have, a, it's an interesting thing, you may not have choice over whether the thing happens to you or not. But you do have a, a choice about how you frame it. It's a psychological phenomenon rediscovered in the second half of the of the 20th century. And one of the frames you can put it in is you can say, you know, I'm really actually being tested by this. Well, who is testing me? Well, you know, there's different ways to go, but I have some fun with it. And I describe, I say, these are these imaginary stoic gods. And they're, they're the ones responsible for this setback. And then the question is, well, why would they do that? And the answer is because they love me and want me to flourish. <laughs> okay? So they know that a life in which you never experience setbacks is going to end up a terrible life because you all, unless you are a blessed individual, you're going to ultimately experience a setback. You will ha have had zero experience dealing with them. And it's gonna wipe you out. You know, there's the equivalent in terms of bio biology, there's your biological immune system. And in order to keep it healthy, you have to expose it to germs and viruses and, and so on. Uh, so if you grew up in a germ-free environment, good for you. But if I were you, I wouldn't go outside. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> I would hold my breath when I'm inside. But you have also a psychological immune system. And if you want it to keep healthy, you've got to challenge it. You've got to do things that are, are unpleasant, things that are, are difficult. You have to face setbacks. And so one way to think about it is when you do face a setback, uh, ah, it's, uh, it's helping, it's, it's my, uh, my booster shot, right, for my uh, psychological immune system. And uh, how, how do I pass this test, this challenge? Got to do two things. Number one is you've got to come up with a, a, a really good workaround for the setback. And number two, you got to keep calm and cool as you do so. And you got to keep in the back of your mind. It's kind of like a game. You know, it's, it's like if you're an athlete and you want to succeed as an athlete, 
you need a coach who isn't going to pamper you. You need a coach who is going to put you through a grind because you're going to end up stronger. You're going to end up more resilient, right? And, um, and so the idea is with life setbacks, you, you treat it in, in that frame. You sort of say, um, this is, uh, I can make it, so this is for my own good. Because number one, I'm going to gain competence by coming up with a workaround for the setback. And number two, I'm going to become more resilient because I'm going to not let it upset me. I'm going to keep my cool as I, uh, as I do this. So again, in your stoic practice, you reach this bizarre state at which when a setback comes along, you don't sort of say, oh man, they was going so good, but you actually perk up a bit. Oh, here's an interesting challenge. I'm going to show the stoic gods who's in charge here, because I'm going to deal with this not only in a brilliant way, but I'm going to stay calm and cool the whole time. I love the imagery of the psychological immune system. It's like we have to be exposed to these setbacks to be yes. able to get stronger. And I think about that simultaneously with Nassim Tlaib's work in Anti-Fragile yes. when he talks about things that get stronger from disorder, chaos, or in this circumstance, setbacks or failures, right? We look at failures and say, all right, well, where's the gift, right? Where's the yep. gift in this failure? And in that circumstance, you can almost think of a, you know, in any situation, no matter what happens, there's always win-win. It's always win-win because you either get what you want yes. or you receive the gift in not getting what you want. Yep. <laughs> and uh, not to, to name any generations in particular, but uh, there seems to be an, a, a generation out there right now that seems to uh, have underdeveloped uh, psychological immune systems. Uh, they uh, tend to get, I, I encountered some of them in the classroom, they intend that they, they tend to get very upset over what should be minor things. And one way of diagnosing that is because they grew up in a situation where they were never challenged. There was always an adult present to settle any disputes that mm -hmm. arose. Everybody got a first place trophy, regardless of how they did. And it's really neat while it lasts, but unfortunately you emerge into adult life and then you realize, oh, the world's actually a difficult place. This is so, why I'm a big believer in tough love as an example. Yeah, it's like, yeah. let's face the challenge. And, you yeah. know, I think that's the right thing to do for someone else is to allow them to grow through a failure yeah. or setback yeah. instead of coddling and saying, look, here's a trophy for your, your participation, your effort. You know, you did great, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, no. And, and, you know, there's also uh, what's called helicopter parenting, mm -hmm. where you're you're pre preventing any kind of stress uh, on a kid. And there's one thing I just acquired this uh, term uh, a few days ago: snowplow parenting, where what you're doing is clearing the path for yes. your kid. Uh, and uh, then there's what's called free range parenting, where you're basically saying, you know what? Uh, I'm going to let this kid do some risky things because there's some very important lessons that he will learn from doing it. Uh, and he won't uh, end up being a child in an, in an adult body. He will end up being, a, 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 he will end up being an adult capable of dealing with the world's uh, challenges, with life's challenges. Well, it's like the phrase or the, you know, philosophy that the teacher will appear when the student yes. is ready. Yes. And, and the, the, the student is not ready to read a concept you know, this, this, the student is going to gloss over a concept until they face that in their own circumstance. Yes. And uh, the whole thing about, about failing, it hurts, but it's good hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and if you learn how to rebound from it. Uh, so um, last weekend, I raced, uh, I'm a uh, competitive rower. And in the off season, we do uh, indoor rowing on rowing machines. Um, I uh, raced in the National Lightweight Championship. And uh, to answer your question, no, I did not win. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really interesting because, uh, you know, there was a time uh, in my life when I would have taken that as something to be absolutely uh, ashamed of, you know, because um, I was way, way, way back. Uh, but this time it was sort of like, no, you know, I may not have won the race, but it was an important training experience because when you're doing um, the race, this is a, 
uh, a 2000 meter uh, uh, race, which lasts about for eight minutes, but you get it pretty up. fast, by the way, that's fast. Yeah. Okay. You get an up front seat to watch these deep voices in your mind come out and take the stage. The voice that says, you know, Bill, you could just quit. Yes. Just quit. It would be so easy or slow down or let that other boat overtake you because, you know, it'll be so much easier then. And I think that wrestling with those voices helps you keep them in the back bedroom where they belong, right? Not coming out. And because in, in many people, they allow those voices to control their lives, their mm. existences. I'm that is saying. so good. And I think about that as a practice. That's a practice, right? Encounter yes. tough things, when it, whether it's physically, you know, because physically allows sort of the, you know, that that dialogue to come to the forefront to say, yep. hey, quit now, quit now. Yep. You don't need to do this. This is just, this is difficult. This is uncomfortable. By the way, you're 70. Come on, you don't need to do this. Yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so what other practices would you point to? Uh, otherwise, I mean, I think physical from a fitness perspective is a great example. Was there anything else that you would point to? Yeah, one one quick one that's got an awkward name because I can't think of a better name. And it's a prospective retrospection. Uh, so if you look back at your your life, you'll find there are times when you call them the good old days. And you you look back and you realize, I mean, for me, there was this period where I was uh, living in Montana on the edge of the woods and the world was my oyster and I would go back to those woods. And I recently uh, did a Google search and found the map and found that those woods are now uh, a, an auto junkyard. No, <laughs> right? that's and so, so sad. you kind of realize, yeah, you cannot go back. Uh, mm. But then realize at that time, I would have been like 14. I was not a happy camper. I was a typical 14 year old, mm -hmm. right? And yet now, you know, oh, if only I could get back there. Uh, prospective retrospection is this, this um, uh, uh, psychological technique where you keep in mind that these are, if you're lucky enough to live long enough, these are for you, the good old days, mm. in the sense that someday, I hope this isn't true. But someday you could find yourself uh, in a nursing home, you know, a lot of people end up there. And you're going to be in a in a commons room, and you're going to be wired into your chair. So an alarm goes off if you try to stand up and the TV <laughs> is playing really loud, because some people can't hear it otherwise. And you're going to be thinking back to this very moment right now, ah, to be giving a, a podcast again, to be mm -hmm. doing that once again. And that can bring, again, so what is it? It gives a kind of a zest to what could otherwise be just a humdrum moment of a typical day. Uh, but there will come a time, if you're lucky, there will come a time when you will wish that you could be right back to this very moment. I feel like that thought process of, hey, these are the good old days can be applied to every moment of our life. Yes. And even if you're in that nursing home, it's like, these are the good old days. You know, yeah. these are the good old days. Who knows? Um, you know, you, you could look back in your next life and say, wow, that was such an interesting experience. And here's what I learned. And here's what I took forward. I think that that innate curiosity, what we started this conversation with, it's almost like, well, what if these were the good old days? You know, even if it doesn't feel like it in that moment, what if they were? And what if I acted like they were? Yeah. And it's an easy thing. I mean, I think of it when I'm mowing a lawn on a hot summer day, uh, I think, you know, when I'm in the hospital, when I'm in, you know, the nursing home, whatever. I'm going to say, wouldn't it, wasn't it great? I could push a, a, a lawnmower around for, for that long and oh, to be back to that time of my life. It actually makes a lot of difficult things easier. Yes. Uh, you know, and troubling relationships. Well, you know, this relationship won't last. If nothing else, I will eventually die. And uh, so, you know, you should enjoy it. Savor the life you're existing while preparing yourself for a radically different life. 
Bill, this is amazing. Thank you so much for this conversation. I really appreciate it. I want to transition into the rapid fire as I kind of joked with you before the conversation today. We'll call it rapid fire, but maybe we'll dive in a little bit deeper in some of these uh, concepts here. Uh, But it's called the rare air questionnaire. Of course, applying the thoughts of stoicism is not completely common. In many ways, it's uncommon. Uh, I'm sure like you, like like me, you'd like to see this become more common and and, uh, more widespread because I think it would solve a lot of the psychological and mental health issues that we're seeing across uh, the world, really. Um, But in terms of some of the questions that I have for you, obviously, being a prolific author yourself uh, and also, you know, someone who studies psychology, studies philosophy, studies really just the human condition and and has a deep sense of curiosity. I would imagine you are a big reader. Uh, If you had to point to two or three of the most impactful books that you've read over the past few years, what would those be and why? Um, I'm going to give you more than a few years. So I'll I'll give you two from the course of my life. One was reading Henry David Thoreau. Uh, Walden Pond back in uh, in high school. Uh, it planted a seed in my brain that sometimes has been rattling around and sometimes has sprouted into uh, a giant tree. But that whole notion of, you know, there's the way most people are living their lives. And then there's another way it can be done. And the other way actually has a lot going for it, but most people are oblivious to it. They want to be rich and famous, as we as we talked about. Another one, and you actually mentioned them earlier, is um, Seneca's uh, writings, including uh, his letters to Lucilius. He also has an uh, um, an essay uh, titled "On Anger," and uh, I I read it while waiting in a doctor's office. And you know how doctor's offices work. They tell you to be there 15 minutes early <laughs> so they can be an hour late. And oh, yeah. so this it was like an hour and a half, but I was reading his essay on anger and it was the most amazing thing. I found I could not get angry. <laughs> it was just impossible because I was thinking about getting angry is so stupid, you know, and everything else. And it just, it just couldn't do that. So that was part of the things that, uh, that's, that really impressed me about stoicism. I love that. Thank you for that. And uh, both, uh, obviously, Seneca and Henry David Thoreau are two, you know, people that will make you see reality in tremendously different ways. And that's, I think you and I share that uh, in common in terms of reading. It's like, I want to read something that shifts the way that I think, and the way that I behave and the way that I interact with the world. And and obviously, uh, both you know, suggestions there in addition to the essay. Uh, I've not read the essay on anger. So I have to check that out myself. Um, but Bill, what's the biggest way that you elevate your life on a daily basis? What, what would you point to if you had a point to one? Um, we discussed it b- before, negative visualization. Uh, and I do that f- five, six times a day. It's really easy to do. Uh, it takes a few seconds to do it. Um, my wife knows I'm doing it because I'll be here working in the back bedroom and she'll hear me yell out, thanks for existing. And she knows, <laughs> oh, I know what you've been doing. And uh, I, I am always impressed by the power it has to just make you want to hug whatever life you're, you're living. Uh, because you've got so much, and yet you're oblivious to it. Uh, but there's so much you have to lose, and yet you focus like a laser beam on the one additional thing that if you got it would make your life perfect. That's amazing. Thank you for that. And and uh, I don't know if it's necessary to go too much deeper on that because we've talked so much about it um, in this in this discussion, but uh, that's a beautiful practice. What's the biggest way that you elevate others around you, Bill? Um, so that, that's my current project uh, of the last about two years of just my connection with, with uh, other people. So I've, I've got a bunch of different things kind of going on there, but let me run through a quick list. Uh, one is, um, is simply saying thank you. Uh, and sometimes I go over the top in saying thank you. Uh, I go out into the world with very low expectations. You know, I expect, like, like Marcus Aurelius did, you know, I expect people to be semi-competent and, and so on. And so when I get, encounter somebody who actually does their job well, I glow. <laughs> and, uh, and people don't expect that. And then you realize, you know, people actually aren't thanked enough. They're taken for granted. And yet they provide useful services and make a big difference in my life. And so it's entirely appropriate to thank them. Um, I've also found usually when somebody thanks you, it's possible to top that 
by thanking them back. So when I have uh, readers, you know, I get emails, readers who, who thank me for the books I've, I've written, I write them back. Thank you for reading those books. It's a two-way uh, two kind of thing. So I've kind of gotten over the top in, uh, in, in my uh, thanks. Uh, another thing is complimenting people in uh, unusual ways. So a lot of times, you know, you, you don't want to comment on somebody. You can't tell somebody else how to live your how to live their life. If you do it, it'll it'll backfire, right? But what you can do is you can pick out some trait that you see within them, and you can um, you can water that trait by saying, you know, I like the way you X, where X is the thing, you know. I, I like your skills, you know, with, with people. You did a really great job of answering that question, whatever. So it's this kind of praise that's kind of coupled somehow mm -hmm. to my thought on something they might not know. They have this, this power and they might not know how potent it is. So to try to bring that out. Um, and again, they don't see it coming because we live, we're all so ego bound that we're wrapped up in ourselves and to, to praise somebody else or to thank somebody else is almost an admission of need on our part. And we don't wanna do that. Uh, the last one is being a listener. Um, so uh, I'm trying to get much better at being a listener. And I've now got uh, what I call the uh, 2080 rule. Uh, so that in a conversation, I should talk 20% of the time, they should talk 80% of the time. And I accomplish that by number one, actually listening to what they have to say. And I realized that it, for, for most of my life, that hasn't been true. You know, it's, it's a kind of a one-sided, two one-sided conversations where we talk past each other, but actually listening to what people have to say and asking questions, right? that show that I'm actually interested in what they have to say. Uh, so surprise number one is that, um, uh, is that in many cases, I will learn an incredible amount from simply listening to what, they have great stories to tell. They have very interesting lives and they're perfectly willing to share what they have. And it's absolutely amazing. And then you see people who, when they realize, oh, here's another human being who's actually interested in me, they open, you know, like flowers in the desert after the once a year uh, rain uh, that, that uh, takes place. So these have been some experiments just in uh, connection with other people. I have to push my ego into the background to be able to do these, but uh, mm -hmm. it's just the latest round in my ongoing battle against my ego. Yeah, that's so good. And I've experienced a similar um, set of circumstances myself. In fact, uh, Dale Carnegie, he wrote the book, How to Win Friends and Influence yes. People. And it's so interesting when he talked about, hey, if you want to influence someone else, it's ask more questions, it's yep. listen more, it's place the intention on that person. And the gift that I've received from that, it sounds like you've received similarly, is that we learn more about someone else. You yes. know, you, you stoke that curiosity, you strengthen the ability to be humble more often rather than, hey, I have all the answers. So let me tell you, um, I think that that is uh, that's amazing and that's really valuable. But I want to I want to acknowledge you and I want to thank you. Um, for sharing your tremendous wisdom that, you know, I think you would agree is, is borrowed. You've borrowed it from oh, some I'm of the middleman. The... <laughs> I am the middleman. Thank Seneca, you know, thank Epictetus. Uh, I'm merely the middleman. And I want to thank you right back, right back at you here for, uh, for uh, inviting me onto your show. Oh, well, it's been absolutely my pleasure. And I think that what we're talking about today is it's a critical centerpiece for people who want to live that good life and uh, they want to encounter sort of this life of being a human being in the most optimal way um, because you know it can be challenging if we don't understand these things and, and I think where we started the conversation around psychology um, and how our brain works is was important and then it's about an interaction of not only our internal but our external environment and you have really done such a great uh you know service to the listeners today so i just want to thank you for that before i ask you my last question 
tell the listeners where they can find you, uh, where they can find your books. And by the way, we'll put links in the show notes as to where they can find you. But if you were to share that right now, where, where, where can the listeners go? Okay, I scrupulously avoid social media for deep reasons that we haven't uh, had time to go into here. But uh, if you want to find out uh, what I've done, what I've been up to, uh, I am at WilliamBIrvin.com. That's B as in boy. And there's free stuff to read. Uh, there's more of me than any single human being should be exposed to. Uh, but it's all there. And so I encourage you. Uh, there's also free stuff on stoicism. You know, if you want to dip a toe into stoicism, I've got um, um, a blog uh, that I did. And so it's a great way to, to dip one toe and see what's going on. Absolutely. And again, we'll put links in the show notes uh, as where the listeners can find you, Bill. Um, and there's a lot of great works that the listeners can dive in, in you know, in addition to the blogs, including books and so forth. Uh, but Bill, this has been a true pleasure. Are there any parting thoughts or words of wisdom that you'd like to share with Elevate Nation today? Uh, I would like to wish everybody an excellent life and remind them that uh, the form that life takes is very much in their uh, in their control. The past is over. Today is yet to be lived. And so is tomorrow. So have a great life would be my advice. Timeless wisdom. Thank you so much, Bill. Until next time, my friend, we'll see you then. Elevate Nation, what a valuable discussion with Bill Irvin. And when I think about this philosophy of stoicism, it, you know, in many ways, it's uh, you can you can think about it in terms of, OK, well, it's a it's a way of thinking. And, yeah, it's a high level. But this is a practical approach to living life. It's a practical approach to optimizing your outcomes as an investor. Believe it or not, I think that the way that we manage our mind, we manage the way that we estimate certain circumstances or events it really changes the way that we perform and interact with our environment as well. Not only our enjoyment or our fulfillment or our experience, but I believe that it ultimately impacts outcomes as well. And so I would encourage you to re-listen to the show, whether it's one or two or three more times. And the reason why is because I think there's so much deep and timeless wisdom that we may gloss over if we're not careful, if we're not paying attention. Um, and sometimes when we listen twice or of course, three times we listen twice or we really learn two or three or more times as much. And um, sometimes that learning that can then be applied is really how we truly understand and truly embody uh, and really anchor in that understanding within the cells of our body as corny and as ridiculous as that sounds. I believe that's how we learn. That's how we change. That's how we grow. And that's how we improve the outcomes of our real estate portfolio, of our life, of you know our relationships and so on and so forth. I want to encourage you to identify what are your top one, two or three distinctions or takeaways from this episode and share those with a friend, you know, have a discussion with someone else. Here's what I thought. Here's why I think stoic philosophy could be important for me. Here's what it could do for my business here. Here's what it could do for my life or my well-being. What do you think? And uh, how are you applying this? So having a discussion, I think, allows us to grow even further. At the end of the day, it's all about taking massive action. So what you learned today, put into action in terms of the way that you think, the way that you behave. Maybe it's a quote. Maybe the quote is something you want to put on your wall. Maybe it was one that we shared today, or maybe it's something that you want to dive into. Maybe it's a book you want to read that were mentioned uh, today. Take massive action. Elevate Nation, I just want to thank you so much for being here. And until next time, we'll see you then. Thank you for listening to Elevate. If you enjoy this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to elevate your results by taking immediate action on what you learned. For more, visit elevatepod.com.